Hello and welcome to another tutorial. So this time we are going to be continuing to extend the real-time strategy series. So we've previously gotten stuff set up so we can build items and we can have that work in different ways. But one of the things that we haven't done, which we're going to focus on in this video, is having that building actually consume resources. And there's a couple of different ways that we want to have that work because different games use different processes. Some have it that when you queue an item, you immediately consume those resources. Others have it that you can queue it even when you don't actually have them and it slowly ticks away. So we're going to, much like with how we approach the building of things, we're going to support both scenarios here for it. So, to begin with, there is a couple of things that I've actually already gone and added in a couple of little bits that I've set up. So I've created this thing called a resource bank. So this will actually hold all of the resources. Uh, and the reason I've grouped it into a particular script and I'll end up linking the actual builders to it, the reason for that is so that uh, if we had you know, RAIs in this, the AIs can have their own resource bank and we can try and have things where the AI is having to sort of you know, conform to the, the rules of the game much more than the way that a player is having to. I want to try and avoid the AI having to actually cheat. So I've set up a little bit of stuff for that. I have already set up some bits here for the UI. And there's a couple of things that I've set up in code as well. So I've put these as a separate commit so you can see the particular changes in that. Uh, but I've set up things like for the display of the resources, having just this little UI element, which I've already created a prefab for it. Uh, the UI for the resource bank, I've intentionally not done the implementation for that yet because there's a couple of key things I want to actually show. Uh, with that. But one of the big things is I've set up this construction resource. So I've made it that we've got a few different categories of ones. And I've also set up so that we'll have this sort of skeleton resource bank. Uh, so that's going to have a lot of the particular bits and pieces in it. So I want to start getting this implemented. And what I'm going to actually start with is I'm going to start with the resource bank itself and so getting the bits and pieces up and running for that. So I want to be able to define the initial resources that we have uh, for our actual setup. So I'm going to have here a serialize field We'll have a list of our construction resource, and these will be the starting resources, like that. Now, providing them in a list allows me to work with it in the editor, but I'm going to need to be doing a lot of looking up of things based upon the resource type. So keeping it as a list is not really actually great for working with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually have a dictionary and we'll have that and resource amounts. So a dictionary Unity doesn't support currently nicely serializing that in the inspector. There are add-ons that do allow you to do that. There are ways of working around it. Uh, but because it doesn't support it, I'm going to actually just have our own one here that's not serialized. And then what I will do is in awake, I'm going to build up that actual map of resource. So we want to build that up. So I'm going to have, okay, for all of those resources, what I want to do is get the current amount because it's possible that that list, even though it's not a good practice, someone could add the same resource multiple times. So I'm going to make it that that actually works. 
So what I will do is I will attempt to get that current actual amount. So I'll go try get value of a resource type and we store that out. Then the resource amount, all I do is add to that the actual amount that's been configured in the inspector and then I store it back. So it just builds up that map for us so we've got that. So that's good. And I'm going to make the UI side actually the thing that I get up and running first. So with the UI side, our normal approach, I want to iterate over those available resources and I want to um, spawn the prefab and configure that, which we've already got the interfaces here for configuring it. Now that resource map I have that we have here, so that resource map I've made it private. Now I could make it accessible externally, but it would always be able to be modified. And this is one of the tricky things when we're wanting to have something that is not able to be modified externally, but we want to be able to iterate over it. So what I can do is I'm going to actually set up a function here in the resource bank that what I will do is it will look like this. So iterate current resources. And I'm going to have it that what gets passed in is a system.action. So this allows me to pass in a function or a chunk of code for it to actually run. So the iteration and the accessing of that private data will only happen within the actual resource bank, which means I can ensure that the data is kept read-only to everything external. Other things can't modify it except through the interfaces we provide but they can still do things like iterate over it. Uh, so what we provide is a construction resource. So these are the two sort of parameters that will uh, be asked uh, to this iterator function. So we have that. And then what we would do is for each, and we loop over the resource amounts like that. And then we just go iterate a function. We provide the key and the value. So it will run whatever code we have provided and it gives it those bits of data. These are ones that will pass by value. So it's creating a copy of them. It's not going to be able to modify them. So what my UI code ends up looking like is a little bit different to what we might expect. What I would do is so set up the resource UI. So I'd go linked bank, iterate current resources, and then I have construction resource, my type, our amount, And then I can provide the block of code here. So first thing I would do is I would instantiate our prefab. So our new resource UI. We do our usual logic. We have our resource UI prefab. We have the root like that. So we've instantiated it. I need to grab the logic for it. Uh, so we grab this. This allows us to get that script that's attached to it. So we get component like that. Now we can configure that bit of UI. Uh, so our logic. So we tell it to configure. 
we give it the resource type and amount, and then we just store that into the map. So uh, UI map resource type. This just is going to allow us to quickly and easily look up that resource script if we need to. So we add that in. So this is a pattern I use at times in cases like of this, where I really want to have data uh, private and contained, but I want something to be able to easily iterate over it. Uh, so this can be a really handy way of setting things up. So that, all going well, if I run it, I should see it initially nothing, because if I remember my resource bank, I need to actually configure some resources here. So we'll say we have 500, 600. I'm just using different values, so it's really easy to tell uh, what we actually have. So it should see them appear here, and we can, and those amounts are correct. So that's good. We've got those appearing now. So let's start actually making these be used and thinking about how we want to have them be used. So I did mention that there are two different ways uh, of having this work that I want to be able to support. I want to be able to support the idea that something has a cost up front that has to be paid or that it has a cost that gets paid sort of incrementally over time. And we could also think about the refund mode as well, because we could have it that we refund the full amount, or we could refund none of it, could refund a partial amount. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up an enum here for the cost mode, so pay over time or pay up front. That's one of the things we're going to have. I'm also going to have our refund mode. So we'll have full or none. So I can set up outside of our build data we'll have serialize field, a cost mode, and what I will do is I will default that to pay up front. That's actually the easiest one. Uh, the payment over time is actually the tricky one. Having it be paid up front is super easy. Paying it over time is really tricky, uh, but very doable be able to make that work. So okay, we've made it that we can set those. Going to have to do a couple of other things. So we need to make it so that we actually have our costs configured. So what I'm going to do is this where we had cost, I'm going to change this to be a list of our construction resources. And this I'm going to call resource costs. Now that is immediately going to kick off a few errors and that's okay. So we'll do like that. So I'll have a couple of things that will be getting a little bit grumpy at us because we did have costs previously configured. So that's okay, all I will do is for those, because I'm already initializing it, I don't need to do anything else. So get rid of these, and the last one, like that. So that should get us back to having uh, no errors. And I would now be able to configure the costs for these different things. So I'm going to say, okay, well, a B 
barracks has a cost in terms of wood and metal. And I'm just going to give some really basic defaults here. Uh, and I'm going to copy those to make my setup a little bit easier. We'll say a factory costs more metal. And we'll say for a power plant, there'd obviously be a lot of balancing and things like that that we need to go into this. Uh, our soldiers, uh, there is obviously, we'll say, a food cost. And we could do things where there is a persistent cost, stuff like of that. That's a separate thing that I think we'll take a look at. Uh, we've got then things in terms of, let's say there is a wood cost there and a metal cost, maybe for some supplies or training materials. And then finally for our tank, uh, probably going to have a pretty hefty metal cost, but we'll say no actual food cost. So a few different priced things there. Um, we do also have our upgrade one. Let's say upgrading something. We need to spend a few different things. Just going to make some random prices up here. Be a lot of balancing that you would do with this. This would be where spreadsheets would come in super handy. But we've got those set up. So we've got costs configured for things. And now we want to start actually using these and looking at how we actually make this work. Because there's obviously quite a bit uh, to making this work. And one of the big things is, as I said, that having, having sort of the uh, payment over time, that's actually the trickiest and most difficult part to make work. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the really hard one. So I'm actually going to do that one first. Uh, the other thing I do need is I need a resource bank that this can link to. So we'll have that set up. So I'll link that up now because otherwise I will forget. Uh, so this makes it that each builder has its own you know, ability to link to a resource bank. Uh, I have the two builders already configured. So builder one is pay up front and builder two is the same. So those are using the defaults. So, okay. Let's start looking at what changes for setting this up because there is quite a bit we need to do to make this work, uh, but it's also very, very doable. And I'm going to do the payment over time first because that's actually the trickiest. So where we'll start with that is for payment over time. When it ticks here, one of the things with this is that ticking is reliant on there being resources available for it to progress if we are doing that uh, build over time. So I kind of need to know if there is resources available and I need a way to be able to essentially consume those resources. So similar to what I did before where I was being able to pass something in and you know, being able to pass in a function that it can run, I want to support that here. So essentially a function that performs that resource requisition. So we tell it, I want X amount and it comes back and it says, cool, I've been able to give you this amount. So that's sort of the thing I want. Now, because it's returning rather than using a system action, I use a system func. So with that, I'm going to provide the type. I'm going to provide the amount that I want. 
and it's going to return, so the last one with a system func is always what the return type is, it's going to return how much it's actually been able to give me. Uh, so this is going to be my requisition function. So, okay, we need to split things up a little bit here. Firstly, I'm going to store out our attempted progress, which this part here, that delta time over that, that's how much progress we're attempting to make. It's not necessarily how much progress we're going to make, but it is how much we are attempting to make. So what I would say is we'll use if we've got a requisition function as our way of determining whether we're having to do something more complex here. So if we have a requisition function, so if it's not equal to null, then we're going to do slightly different logic. Otherwise, we'll do this because the progress actually needs to be tracked differently. So if we don't have, if we have a requisition function, our actual progress has to be based upon the amount of resources we have actually managed to acquire. So what I'm going to need to do here is keep track of the total resources required and the total resources supplied. Because when we are doing this actual requisition process, our current build progress is going to be based upon that resources supplied divided by the resources required. So time controls how fast we try and consume those resources, but we actually look at what our specific progress was. So I need to be storing what resources I've actually consumed here, and it'd be handy if there's an easy way for me to store what resources are required. So, okay, I'm going to have a uh, dictionary here of construction time, construction resource and our type and our int. And this is going to be resources required. And then I'm going to have a resources consumed. So when I go to build the data here, well, what I can do is firstly build up that cost data. So for each resource in object being built. So remember that's a list. So what I need to do is a similar bit of logic to what we've done before, because we could have duplicates. We really shouldn't, we really want to avoid that. And part of the reason for moving it into the dictionary is to ensure that we don't have that, uh, but we make it that we handle it as safely as possible. Uh, so resources required. That we want to do a try get value of our type. And this just allows us to then do amount required. So just on the off chance there's a duplicate, we've got that handled. So we just store that. While I'm at it, our resources consumed, what I will do is not have that. I'll have it set to zero. I will also have this updated by our resource amount. So this will build up the total resources required. Uh, and so that's good. So we have our amount of resources that we require is correct. We've got these handy ones set up for the resource consumption. 
and we've got our attempted progress here. So we can start to figure out, okay, what are the resources we're wanting to try and then use? Now, one of the things with this is, depending upon what the build time is, we might be trying to consume, well, here, consume effectively 0.1 of a resource, but we're using integers for them intentionally uh, so that things are a nice uh, regular number. But that gets complicated if we're trying to work with floats. We don't want to shift that into floats. That gets messy. So what I tend to do for something like of this is I actually keep track of the fractional amount consumed and I don't try and actually consume it until that is an integer amount. So we're actually going to set up another dictionary here that is again our type, but this time is a float. So this is fractional consumption pending for one of a, there's not really a great name for it. This is about the best one I can come up with. We're going to do the same thing uh, of initializing it to zero. So, okay. What I want to do here is update the amount we've tried to consume and if possible requisition it. So we're going to loop through our resources that we require. Uh, so in resources required so we're just going to pull out the resource type. And we'll call this our resource amount. Just want to try and be consistent with the naming. We don't strictly need to pull it out like that. But the reason I do is it makes the code a lot clearer and easier to read. And I think that's really important. So, okay. It's possible that resource amount is zero. If it is, do nothing because we don't need to actually do anything with it. We're not trying to consume any of it. Uh, shouldn't really happen, but just in case, we might as well not run any of the other much slower logic uh, if this is or you know, not actually being used. Similarly, our resources required so resources required, uh, if that is equal to the resources consumed, then we've already consumed everything we need for that and we just skip it. So we've supplied everything, nothing further we need to do there. Now we can actually start to do this handy sort of fractional calculation. So I'm going to store this off. Our new fractional amount is our fractional consumption pending for the resource type plus, and I'll actually do this on a separate line just to make it a little bit clearer. What we add to that is our resource amount multiplied by our attempted progress. That's the ideal amount that we are trying to consume. Then what I can do is, the last thing I'll do is I'll store it back. So the resource type is that new fractional amount. So can we try and consume this? or attempt to. So can we attempt to consume it? So what we will do is we'll check if the new fractional amount is greater than or equal to one. So F is in, essentially we're requesting at least a whole integer amount. 
what I would do is our amount supplied is equal to our resource requisition function here. So requisition function, our resource type, we floor it to an integer of that new fractional amount, like that. That gives us the amount that's actually been supplied. We take that away because we don't want to accidentally consume more than we should. And then we update the amount of resources we've supplied. And we also update our resources consumed. So our resource type. So the idea behind this is it might tick up and be like, okay, we, we were after point one, you know, wood, point two, point three, point four. As soon as it gets to over one, it will then try and actually consume that amount. So that means that if we have a limited amount of that resource available, the progress will actually halt. Uh, but we're still trying to consume it at a particular rate. So the time for the building still actually matters. It controls how fast we try and pull in the resources. Uh, but it's just a really handy way of sort of working with it, this sort of fractional approach. Uh, I've used this for a few other things. Anytime where you've got stuff where you're sort of blending integers and uh, floats. Uh, damage over time is another case where what I'll do is if my health is in integers, but you've got a damage over time, that makes it tricky. So what you can do is store up that fractional amount of damage to apply. And as soon as it's over an integer level, then you can actually apply that integer component of it. So it's really sort of handy. Now, the one thing I do want to add in here is I just want to make sure that we don't accidentally request too much. It's very unlikely, but just to be 100% certain, what I'm going to do is have the maximum requestable. What that will be is that's the amount that we need in total for that resource minus the actual amount of that resource we have consumed. So then if our new fractional amount is greater than it, then we just limit it. So that handles the case where we might have heaps of one resource available but then we don't have much of another resource available. So we could have one that fully finishes first and we just want to avoid trying to consume more than we actually should. So that's honestly one of the, the, the trickiest part with this is getting this set up. So we've got that data going, tracking the resource consumption, now we will have a bunch of errors as a result of this because how we were ticking things before for the build doesn't actually work anymore because what we were doing was down here we were just running like of this but we need to now be able to provide a function to that. We also need to handle the scenario of if we've got a pay up front we need to just apply those resource consumptions immediately. So what I will do is I will add in a helper for that first uh, and I'll add in a public void uh, and what I might do is because we already will know what the cost is uh, so consume all resources resources. Uh, what this will do is, and we, there's a couple of ways I could approach this. I could make it that this is something that attempts to do that, or I could make it something that just actually you know, says that it's done it. Uh, what I'm going to do is I will loop through 
uh, in our resources required. And I'm just going to say resources consumed like that. Well, mark all resources required as consumed. So that looks good. So now we start fixing up some of the errors that we will have introduced. So what we want to do is we want to start updating things like our tick logic here. So this needs to do slightly different things depending upon whether we are pay up front mode or whether we are tick over time. So I'm going to set that to false to begin with. And if our cost mode is pay up front, then is finished tick, oh, sorry, is finished is our build data dot tick uh, delta time and we pass in null. Otherwise, what we do is we set is finished and we need to provide this a requisition resource helper. Now we know what that function needs to look like. That needs to return an integer. And what that has to do is it takes in a construction resource type. Uh, so that's the resource type. And we have our resource amount. Now for now, I'm just going to have that return zero. We'll implement the actual acquisition and things like of that in momentarily. But okay, so far so good. Our can build stuff. Well, that should actually be doing some checking of if we can afford to build this. So we've got a bunch of scenarios here that can return false. So we're going to check if our cost mode is pay up front, then we need to know if we've actually got uh, those resources available. So what I could do is I could set up a function uh, we're going to say maybe it looks something like, okay, linked resource bank, are resources available? And we give it the buildable, and we could give that the resource costs that we have. So if it reckons that it's not buildable, we return false. So that's straightforward. We'll have to implement that function. So I'm setting up a bunch of interfaces that at the moment aren't going to be doing anything. They'll cause errors. That's intentional. I just want to map out sort of what functions I do need. So here where we are building the data or can build, we'll have checked this. If, however, our cost mode, uh, not that it's not equal to it, if it is pay up front, well, the new build data, I want to mark those resources as consumed, and my resource bank, I want to actually consume those resources. Uh, so we'll say request resources. This, oops, uh, and we provide the buildable resource costs. Now, just in case that fails, so if we can't request those resources, we'll return false. Now this is something where that's you know, we do act, end up doing a new here, so I could split this. 
I mean, it's one of those things of we've got the cost of an allocation versus the cost of doing a conditional again. I think the conditional is generally pretty cheap. So I'm going to structure it like this. So we attempt to request the resources. If we manage to, then cool. We'll just actually pay up front. Then we've got a couple of other things here with canceling the build because we want to be able to refund resources. Uh, so this, well, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change our function here. So every time we cancel, it goes through the actual cancel build function. That makes our life a lot easier. Then we can check, okay, well, my refund mode, if it refunds the full amount, then we want to be able to say, hey, resource bank, uh, add resources and build data resources consumed. So I don't have access to that currently. So we'll mark that as something that we can access. So we'll go for making that public, but we'll do our private get and set logic here. So that's good. We can add those resources back. Now I've got a bunch of interfaces we need to set up on our resource bank to essentially be able to manage all of this. So, okay, first one is this checking of if resources are available. So we want our, our resource available, and that takes in this list of ones. So we're going to have a bool, it'll be a public bool, are resources available, we ask for a list like that. Now, this is again one where we could have duplicates in this. So it comes down to whether we want to sort of handle that gracefully or not. Uh, so what I'm going to do is by default, the answer is yes. And then this is something where there's two ways to go about this. One is to assume that the list, we only see a resource, each resource once. The other is to make it safely handle it. I'm going to make it that we assume there is only one entry. We've made all of the other areas safe for there being multiple, uh, but it starts to get costly. Like those are areas where it's pretty cheap to do that. This is one where I need to construct another dictionary for that, and I think that starts to make it you know, not worth the cost, uh, especially because it's working around something that is a bug. Uh, so, okay, we've got this. I want to be able to make this a little bit easy because we might need to ask about an individual resource. So I'm going to say F is resource available. Uh, and I'll specifically check if it is not. Then I return false. That means I then have a public bool is resource available. And I provide it with that. And so that looks good. What that would then do is that needs to check the amount of the specific resource. And I might actually want that kind of interface where I can go public bool is resource available. And I provide the type and everything as a separate thing. This just gives me maximum sort of flexibility with this. Because then this one ends up doing is resource available. So we just avoid duplicating code, but we provide a variety of useful interfaces for this, which I think is really handy. So, okay, 
This is now going to need to check the amount available is zero. Then what we will do is we will go resources amounts. We do a try get value of our type. And then our return is just if the amount available is greater than or equal to the amount we're wanting to check. So, okay, we've got our setup here to check those. If we take a look, that's now, this is no longer grumpy at us, so that's progress. Uh, we did have our function here for requisitioning the resource. So I wanna be able to say linked resource and request resource. We give it the type and the amount. So this is the next function I'll get up and running. So we go to our bank here and this returns an integer. And I'm just going to steal the line from here because it saves me typing it out. We want to get the amount available. So a lot of it is very similar to this. We actually are just checking uh, that particular amount. So we know the amount available. Now what we need to do is check, okay, well, amount supplied is going to be the minimum of the amount we have available and the amount requested. So amount supplied will be the minimum of the two so that we never supply more than we have and we never supply more than has been requested. So our new amount available is our amount available minus the amount we supplied. The amount we supplied is what we return. So we say back how much we've actually supplied. We update how much we've actually got available for it. So that's good. We can request a particular resource. So let's see what other things are going to be currently grumpy. That's understandably grumpy because I had a typo. We have this request resources that can go through and request stuff via a list. That's actually going to be pretty straightforward. What I will do is in our resource bank, public, and this will return a bool because we're asking for multiple things. So we can't return uh, the individual amounts. We could construct a list or a dictionary. I don't think that that is a good approach for this. I think just indicating success or failure. Which by default, we're going to return true. What I'm also going to do is I am going to F are resources available. So if they're not available, we return false. Just means that we are, it's a little bit of extra overhead, but it means we are absolutely certain that the resources being requested are available. Then I just look through these and I can just go request resource uh, like this, resource type and our amount. Now I don't actually need to check the return value here because we've already verified that we have everything we need and we're just then going and consuming it. So, okay. Quest resources is now there and now happy. And then finally, we have this add resources and we need to make that happy. So that's going to be pretty similar to a lot of these other ones. So public void, add resources. The main difference with this is we actually have this coming in as a dictionary. 
I think potentially we could wrap some of this in a class to minimize some of this juggling between uh, different containers that we're needing to do, uh, but I think this is also still a viable option. So we just loop through all of our ones here like this. So a fairly similar logic that we've done plenty of times uh, before. We just again pull out our resource type and we pull out our resource value. So that's good. Now we check, okay, how much do we currently have available? So we're going to go resource amounts, try get value, and we'll attempt to get that resource type. Store that into our amount available. Our amount available, we then update with that. And we just then go and say, okay, store that back. That's good. We've got our ability to add ones back in. Means our builder should no longer be grumpy. We do need to make sure our UI can actually update though, because that's something that we haven't provided support for. So I want to just set up a notification for that. So Unity Engine dot events. And I'm going to just create uh, and I'll actually make this public so I can easily hook into it. So I have a public Unity event. And this is just going to come and say, okay, well, for this construction resource, here's the new amount. So on resource amount changed. So in any of the places where we modify a resource amount, we just want to go and update or in run this essentially. So where we add resources back and amount available and where we consume the resource, which part of the reason for having sort of, you know, calling other functions that are internal is it just makes this process a lot easier. Uh, it means that we don't need to update multiple areas of code. We've got just a single place where this is actually stored. So we've got that. Our UI can then actually link into that. So I can set up in our UI function here, void on resource amount changed and that can take in a type like that and all that would do is that would go to our UI map get that resource type and say hey update the resource amount to this new value we just need to tell our linked bank that we have that as a listener like that. So we don't get any errors, hopefully. And we're pretty right to be able to test this out. So if we take a bit of a, a look at what we've gotten set up, we modified our buildable objects. So they store these costs. We set up this resource bank where it keeps track of the current ones that we've got. We're largely using dictionaries for storing things like our current amounts. We added in some helpers so that we can keep that data private, but still iterate over it. And a bunch of helpers to check, okay, I want to know if I've got resources available. And to be able to query that in a few different ways. And then we added in stuff for being able to request the resources and also add ones back. And then on the builder side, what we've done largely in terms of our changes is our actual in progress build stuff keeps track of a bunch of these things uh, in terms of the resources we need, the resources that have been consumed, 
Uh, I should actually update this as well, just so that we're keeping those consistent. So we can keep track of the amount of resources we need. So when we're ticking, if we have to go through this requisition process, then we store up our fractional amounts until we have a whole number, an integer number that we can request. And then when we do, we request it and we take that away from the amount we're trying to request. And then we keep going until we've essentially consumed all the resources we need. That lets us make sure that our progress looks correct. Uh, and we're always trying to request based upon the amount of time that's progressed. The actual process then for the rest of the stuff is all pretty straightforward in terms of we only needed to add in a couple of little extra calls, a few different ways of branching stuff. So let's see how this goes. What I should find is that I can build stuff, but if I try and build too much, it won't actually let me. So I can queue up a soldier and we can see at the moment it's set to consume the full amount. And if I cancel, stuff gets refunded. Tank, same sort of thing. It only lets me queue up, but I can queue up a few soldiers along with tanks because I, they use sort of separate resources there. Now, if I switch this over to a different builder, so we're using Builder 2. I'm going to switch this over to Builder 1. And I'm going to make Builder 1 be pay over time. So we'll see how that works differently. So we can see it's actually ticking away. Now, I can't queue up multiple of these buildings, but like the units, I can just keep going up to the maximum queue limit even though I won't have enough of the resources available. And what will happen is it will get part of the way through. And we can see it's still able to con was still able to consume wood, but it reached the maximum amount of wood that it needed. And it's out of metal and it stopped actually progressing. Canceling these other ones does nothing. But if I cancel enough of these, it refunds the cost back there. So we've got it working with it costing resources, with it being able to have different resources that it's linking to. We can also change the refund mode so we get nothing back. So if I do that and queue up something and then cancel it, then I'm out that resource. You could have it that it might refund a partial amount. It really depends upon the sort of style that you're wanting to go for with your game. But we've got that flexibility now of kind of the two extremes for both how stuff gets costed and also how stuff gets uh, refunded. And we could easily add in additional ones there if we wanted to. So dive on in and experiment with it. See what kinds of things you might want to create. See if there's other resources you want to set up or other conditions uh, and have a go with getting those up and running. Thanks folks, hope you found the video interesting and helpful. If you have, check out a like and subscribe, it really helps out, it's really appreciated. If you've got any questions or other things that you'd like to see uh, in the series, then chuck those in a comment below. If you are looking for the code for the project that is available up on GitHub, there's a link to that in the description below. You can use it in any of your own projects, commercial or non-commercial ones. Uh, and if you are looking for other ways to support the channel, then I do have a Patreon, and there is a link to that in the description also. But until next time, bye!